Well, good morning, YouTube. Episode 10, Coffee Talk with Hayes. Nothing's changed. Everything's the same. I decided that I wanted to pick up where I last left off from the last episode, where we picked off from where we last left off from that last episode, because I don't want to just leave you hanging. Most of you guys are into, and gals, are into synthesizers, and I want to kind of keep this in some sort of use, useful and valuable context for you. So where we last left off was I basically wanted to establish two things. And number one is that audio is not sound. Audio is an electrical representation of sound through voltage mostly, but also through current. I also wanted to talk a little bit about what is the difference between voltage and current and why we use one over the other. But the important thing is they're almost kind of the same. We can use both of them. And it's basically whenever we want to use one or the other, which is more convenient, which makes more sense, which uses less power, which actually is the one where we need to use power. Uh, considerations like that. The second thing that I wanted to establish was that what's coming out of almost every phase of an amplifier or any audio processing is a copy of what went in. And furthermore, it's a copy that derives its energy from a direct current source. So if you recall, we have our transistor, we have a signal coming into the base. I guess if you're looking at it this way, signal coming into the base. And we also have this rail that I talked about from the emitter and the collector or the drain or the source, however you want to, whichever, you know, like if it's, we don't want to get into those details just yet, if ever, but we have two terminals and you can think of that as a direct current power rail. So imagine just this direct current power rail of voltage and our alternating current audio signal, a little wiggle, hits that and causes a bigger wiggle. So that's a lot to wrap your head around. Now the third thing that I want to talk about, sort of wrap all of this up, is how we can turn this into an oscillator. Hang on a second. Because the whole point of this is to make a speaker go back and forth. Is that not an oscillation? You see? That's what an oscillation is. It's going back and forth at a continuous rate for a determined period of time. So it's really important to understand these fundamentals, I think. When you look at some of these videos on YouTube that show you how to make a simple voltage controlled oscillator on a breadboard using things like what we call a 555 timer or a CD4093 NAND gate or everybody's favorite CD4106 Schmidt trigger. These integrated circuits have one function and that is to produce an oscillation and they can produce different waveforms. So really what I want to talk about today are waveforms. This is pretty fun. When I first got into uh, looking at synthesizers, waveforms eluded me. I understood that there were a few different shapes, but it seemed like there were just many, 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 many shapes. I couldn't uh, quantify any of them really. So really all that we're talking about is the rate at which that speaker moves back and forth. So the easiest one to talk about of course is the sine wave because it's a nice smooth even steady kind of flow back and forth. When we look at this on a graph we see the sort of hump shape like a like you know like this is what we think of when we think of a waveform because it's almost it's like wavy but it's a perfect wave what's interesting is that this sort of perfect notion of a sine wave it is not really said to exist in pure form anywhere in nature by itself but we can we can introduce it as humans because we have electronics that can create a pure form of a sine wave and introduce that into nature in a sense however having said that all waveforms are merely the summation of perfect sine waves that are all coming in at different frequencies. And this gets into fast Fourier transforms, which honestly I don't know much about. I will study this stuff 
some point in the future, but I just know that it gets a, into a very deep rabbit hole at that point. Where perception becomes a really, really interesting thing. Okay, but back to waveforms. So, maybe you've seen the video that I put out on the Isaki oscillator, which is like one of the simplest voltage controlled oscillators that you can come up with. I think I first saw it via Sam at Look Mum No Computer. And I did some more research from there just to figure out, you know, how to make it work. At that point when I saw this video, I actually had some of these components so I could try to make this work. And I failed quite a few times. Eventually though, I achieved success, but I had no understanding of why it worked. I looked at a lot of other videos that were doing the same thing, and I just couldn't understand what was going on. The main reason being is that I had failed to really fully understand that audio is not sound. Because all we need to do is make that speaker go back and forth at a specific rate. And we can do that by making the voltage go through a speaker this way and then making it flip back and go that way. So that is what a lot of these logic integrated circuits like the 4093 and the 4106, this is what they are doing is they are flip and flopping. They're not flip flops, but they're, they're sort of flipping and flopping their state back and forth. And a capacitor, I won't go into the details on this, but what the capacitor does is it literally acts like a reservoir and it slows down the rate of that back and forth. So the larger the capacitor, the lower the frequency, the smaller the capacitor, the higher the frequency. Resistors also add into the mix because they, I believe that you can think of capacitors as the macro scale of like, you know, when I change capacitance, I'll go from a large range of frequencies to another range of frequencies, but it's a large switch, if you see what I'm saying. And then we put a resistor in, in the mix, kind of get like a finer tuning within that range. And you could probably do the vice versa if you really wanted to. That's what's interesting about all of this. But that's a good thing to, to walk away with, I think, right there. It's just understanding why we use capacitors and resistors and how they change the frequency of these waveforms. Now, there's only a handful of fundamental waveforms, as it turns out. You've got your sine wave, you've got square wave, triangle, pulse wave, sawtooth, which you can think of as ramp up or ramp down. So that's kind of six right there. We have like, you know, you may have heard of like super saw or even shark tooth. Super saw is really a lot of waveforms added together, so that's not the same thing. And shark tooth is taking generally like a sine wave and a triangle and adding them together. So again, that's the same thing. It's taking multiple waveforms and adding them together. Not quite the same thing. We've also had the ability to draw our own waveforms digitally since the Fairlight or the Synclavier, I can't remember which one, or maybe both of them did it and possibly something before that. So you may be asking yourself, you know, well, why haven't we been coming up with new fundamental waveforms? It's like, I don't think there really are any. That's really it. And check this out. When we talk about the concept of duty cycle, which is how much of the waveform skews to one side of the cycle or the other. That may be a lot to wrap your head around, sorry, but I gotta move on from that. Duty cycle changes the number of fundamental waveforms down to nearly almost just three. Because now we have, with our pulse wave, we, you know, like that's our square wave, it's just, it just has a duty cycle. Depending, so we have like a very, very long pulse or very, very short pulse. Uh, with our triangle wave, here's what's interesting. If we change the duty cycle on that, we get a ramp down saw tooth or a ramp up saw tooth. So that's only two right there for those. And then what's left? The sine wave. And when you change the duty cycle on the sine wave, it's still, you know, a sine wave, it's just a skewed 
Um, probably more natural. I was going to say unnatural, but it's actually probably more natural. At any rate, you see what I'm saying? There's almost really just three fundamental waveforms. That's all you got to wrap your, wrap your head around. In terms of tones, um, well, the triangle sounds more like the saw, I mean, like, like the sine tooth. When you skew the triangle with, with the duty cycle and turn it into a sawtooth, that has more of a grit to it, um, definitely unlike like a regular triangle or a sine wave. The square wave is what's very interesting. It's just a very powerful sound. It just cuts through really, really, really harsh. And it generally um, has a lot of overtones. That's what's interesting about it is because it is just such a... I mean, you're, you're literally going from one rail to the other rail almost in terms of like the change that you're trying to make. And in the analog world, um, in the acoustic world, like you, you can't do that. You can't just, if you see what I'm trying to say, the speaker can't just flip. It, it does, it tries to at its best, but there is a bit of a delay, just a tiny bit. And uh, so square waves are very, very interesting. And then when you add, um, throw them through a filter, you get a lot of interesting harmonics. Whereas with the sine wave, if you throw that through a filter, you generally just attenuate it and make the signal shorter. So I hope that makes a lot of sense for you now. And I hope that I covered everything. Because I know that when I was coming through all this backwards, trying to put all this together, it was really, really hard to understand the fundamentals coming from just a synthesizer viewpoint. I highly recommend that you, you know, try to move away from that and just focus on microphonics or just uh, transconductance, understanding how sound is reproduced out of speakers, even getting into power, because um, powering circuits is actually a very simple, and it actually is very, very, very beneficial to understand that stuff. Because if you want to get into circuit bending. I mean, I, I, I want to know where all the, you know, where, where the power is coming in, where all the ground is. And then from there, you know, it's, it's just a playground of patching different points together that weren't supposed to be patched together to do all kinds of cool, interesting things. And sometimes there's little Easter eggs left behind that you might be able to find. I know that uh, I do have one integrated circuit, probably came out in the 80s and it was designed to be built for like children's toys, like little laser guns and things that had multiple uh, sound effects on them. And you can send it like, you know, like a little control voltage to one pin and get one sound to come out of the, of the output pin, another one to another pin. But then you start adding different combinations, you get different sounds. And it turns out like if you start experimenting and doing like kind of past what they tell you, you, you get some actually some cool stuff. There's some real Easter eggs and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that's uh, probably why there's a lot of fascination or a lot of attraction with circuit bending to take a lot of these children's toys and try to take out the circuits and then put that into some sort of like adult synthesizer, for example. You never know what you're going to find. Well, you do if you know what the chip is and you can go find the data sheet and just look up you know, the instructions, it's kind of the form of the manual. So what is a data sheet? If you've never heard of this before, what, what is a data sheet? And uh, I mentioned in a past episode, you know, RTFM, read the fine manual. They're both interchangeable. I believe data sheets came first. So as a uh, software engineer, his, uh, you know, historically chanting RTFM a lot, I now feel a little cheap or shamed or something about that because I feel like data sheets were always there and you know and we kind of were stealing some thunder from the electrical engineering crowd. I see a lot of that in the digital age, stealing a lot of thunder from the older camp not realizing hey, people have been doing that for a long, long time. You kids ain't doing nothing new. So but you know, what are you gonna do? You just hope that people are gonna find out what the truth is and roll with it. So likewise, I'm here to make amends that, yeah, I had no idea about data sheets. So for any electrical component, passive, mostly active, you can get what's called a data sheet, which gives you a chart of all its characteristics, its operating 
ranges, like for example, how many volts it will take, what kind of voltage it wants. It's uh, watt rating, current rating, those kinds of things, what frequency ranges it runs at. Some things might tell you like distortion charts for like op amps and things like that. All sorts of things, even measurements of the component sizes itself so that you can use these in AutoCAD so that you can have printed circuit boards made then solder the components on yourself or in a factory or sell as kits for other people to discover. It's really fascinating because it's all out there and all you have to do, for example, if you want to know more about the, the CD4093 NAND gate, you can just um, type in CD4093 datasheet, PDF. Uh, that you learn a few tricks here and there and PDF always helps because you want to just get right to the PDF and avoid going through any websites because you may have to click about five links just to get to the information and you're not always guaranteed that you're going to find something some of this stuff is unobtainium you know but most of it has been replaced almost all of it has similar functions we'll talk about this more in the future but you see this is why I wanted to kind of you know help you to understand that yes you can capture lightning in a bottle two times you can get that genie back if you want to you can get those vintage sounds back because of two reasons number one we know how it was done it's science we can recreate it if we have the devices we can backward engineer them so we know it's we, we can do it but number two the most important reason is because your ears deceive you. When you're thinking of vintage synthesizers, you're most likely thinking of what they sounded like a long time ago if you heard them, or if you're listening to them on re recordings and music. They've been changed. You see, you take a synthesizer into the studio, the first thing they're going to do is, well, they're going to record it flat, but when we go to mix it, we're going to start cutting frequencies. Cutting frequencies, cutting frequencies, cutting frequencies. Synthesizers are problematic because they can just cover up the entire frequency spectrum and leave no room for the other instruments. That's why synthesizers are groove boxes or orchestrations. You see what I'm saying? They're whole entities. Now, now perhaps the synth patch that you're recording is very simple. It could be like a basic sine wave, for example. Very, very, very simple and a limited... Um, range of frequencies that you're only using sure 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 but most people want to play synthesizers like a piano and even when you're recording a piano a piano is very very full it's bringing everything into the mix so a lot of times you know even as a drummer you know I have to be very careful about what I'm adding to a piano performance because piano performances are very percussive but I'm getting a little bit off the beaten path there just a synthesizer in general you know, we're going to cut all of the, not all of them, but a lot of the frequencies when we go to mix. And we may add things like phasers, some delay and some reverb. So most of the time, you know, myself personally, definitely, people are going to add effects to their synthesizers. And a lot of people out there still haven't made the disconnect between what effects are and what synthesizers are. I mean, sure, they know that it's an effect and everything, but a lot of the synthesizers that they may have used came with effects, and they're just used to having everything into one box. So everything kind of gets wrapped up at that point. If you if you don't actually, see, I, I, I'm telling you, you know, before I really really got into guitar pedals this past year, I mean, yeah, I knew about a lot of different effects, but I, mean, I really 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 didn't know the difference between you know, uh, like certain. Um, vibratos versus um well darn now i've already forget what i'm trying to say i was trying to find like like the, the really 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 interesting things but your modulations your phase shifting into your chorus and even what an ensemble is but the one that I was really 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 trying to get into was um the univibe that's what i'm trying to say the univibe and um like any kind of um vibe type kind of circuit very very interesting they're very very subtle the ones that change the volume level very rapidly 
these these circuits they all start to kind of blend into each other like these time modulation that's why guitar players refer to them as modulation effects because what they're really referring to is just time modulation the the most wackiest one being flange effects I think and I'm a big fan of flangers but yeah I really hope that this helps let me see if I can wrap up what I'm trying to talk about here because I think this is going to wrap up this sort of like electronics talk for now please if you have any questions hit me up with questions 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 talking about this stuff because I want to help you understand electronics if that's what you're trying to understand so yeah we're trying to get to this road to understanding what an oscillator is what a voltage controlled oscillator is you know I do want to talk a little bit more about oscillations but just a quick iteration audio is not sound audio is mostly an electrical representation of sound we usually use voltage changes changes in voltages to represent sound itself I, that's still a lot to wrap your head around I understand I understand but don't worry it will all come into play the second thing is that everything is amplified in an audio signal there is always going to be some kind of uh, like a preamp usually there's always going to be some amplification at the end, end of, of the of the circuit even if it doesn't boost the voltage it's going to be there for other reasons that we'll get into buffering uh, impedance matching all kinds well not all kinds but those are the main ones so when your audio signal comes in to any of these what comes out is a copy from a DC power source and that's so wild and if you think about it you know that that 12 volt DC source coming into your synthesizer or 9 volt that's where your the signal coming out is feeding from more more specifically okay think of current flow think of think of the electrons right think of them of the the atoms that are that are in that chain that is your audio signal the the electrons that are coming into the input are not the ones that are coming out of the output now they're really bouncing okay but that conga line of bouncing electrons the one that's coming into the input that is your signal they're not the ones that are coming out of the output that's coming from the power from the wall it's very important to wrap, wrap your head around that one because now I think that you really can start to begin to really understand what's going on with the voltage control oscillator it's really really simple all we're doing is we're just instead of having a microphone sound source or a, um, a pickup from a guitar or a pickup from a piezo element I'm trying to think of what other ways that we can get you know signals in solar light uh, like a theremin um, <laughs> losing my train of thought sorry yeah yeah so instead of using any of those sources we're, we're just going to generate we're just going to generate the source and we can do that by finding a way to make the current go back and forth in this circuit in such a way that there's also a speaker attached and that current bouncing back and forth is going to make the magnetism in the speaker do the same thing. Law of induction, I believe. Oh man, it's so cool. And the way that we can make those electrons go back and forth, it it we we can we can uh, okay so check this out. If we make the electrons go back and forth at a steady rate, that's gonna produce a sine wave we make the electrons just slam like instantaneously and you got to slow down time immensely like this is we're slowing down time you know like so much that's a square wave and if it slams and then just kind of goes and slams right 
that's going to be a um, a sawtooth. Um, see, I can't talk right now. Sorry. What's a down ramp sawtooth called? <laughs> trying to think in two different brain patterns right here my left brain and right brain are going at the same time so it gets, gets kind of gets kind of tough uh, ramp down sawtooth and if it slowly charges then boom slams back and that's going to be a ramp up sawtooth uh, triangle actually okay so what would be the difference between a triangle and a sine wave actually I think triangle would be the, the smooth one and sine wave yeah I can't do that right now, so that's a good one. That's an exercise for me to later. Exercise for me for later is what is the difference in motion between the sine wave and the triangle. But that's those. That's it. Those are the basic waveforms, and that's why when you look at your analog synthesizer and you see these things, that's pretty much it. You know, you'll see other things, and yeah, yeah, there are other forms of synthesis, definitely, but they employ digital processing and that's another story for another day really what we're talking about right now is just analog signal process I mean analog um, synthesis subtract for the means of subtractive synthesis but you know this this also is used in additive synthesis as well okay so that's gonna wrap it up for here I think there is one more thing that I wanted to talk about though I think Uh, 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 uh